initially I wanted this episode to be about a blog that Notion has written and how they're starting to move to sharding and because of limitations in Postgres uh, uh, freeze mechanisms. But as I'm starting writing or, or talking about this article, I was, I was like, you know, I, I, I have a little bit of a weakness when it comes to understanding uh, Postgres locking. There's just so much that conflict with each other when it comes to Postgres. There are, of course, two, three level of locks, table locks, page and row level locks. But then table locks are, is not really what you think they are. You know, to me and mostly most DBAs, I can and I'm, I don't consider myself a VDBA, but mo if, if someone said, hey, acquire a table lock, that means it's a table lock. You can't do anything to that table. But that's not true in Postgres. There are what? I'm looking at six, seven, eight types of table locks. So a table lock by certain type, it, mean, it, it just means that something happened to this table. It doesn't mean you cannot edit this table. You can absolutely do that. It, it's just a, of an indication that same thing with the raw level locks, which is easier to understand and page locks, which ha we have zero knowledge about Postgres that at least from the doc. But that's what I wanted to do in this video. I just want to go through the different types of locks, confusing as they are name wise, and just try to know what what operation I acquire what kind of lock. If I do a vacuum full, what can I do? to my table concurrently. If I do a vacuum normal, the auto vacuum, what can I do? What can't I do? If I do a truncate, what happens? If I do a normal insert, can I do another insert in the table? If I update a row, can I update that same row? These are the questions that I want to understand before I jump into taking out like a bigger project, actual things that happen and try to kind of talk about something that I don't understand, right? That's what I wanted to do in this channel. Let's jump into it. All right, so looking at chapter 13 from the dog, concurrency control, and specifically chapter 13.3, explicit locking. I don't know why they are called explicit locking because most of the things that we're gonna talk about here are not really explicit. It just happened implicitly as a side effect from you running certain operations. And I suppose before we we jump into this, uh, we might need to define what locks are. Locks are critical for concurrency and, and ensuring integrity when it comes to data, right? Uh, they are used in some form in the operating system. If you talk data structures, uh, courses, you will see that locks are talked about in, 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 in terms of semaphores or mutexes, you know, where a certain variable can be locked so that if multiple threads, which is what concurrency is, right? If you're a single user, single thread, you don't have this problem. You don't need to have acquire any locks technically, I suppose. So we acquire mutexes and locks to ensure correctness. The, all, the, the types that are familiar and popular are shared locks. If someone, if someone is a read a value, think of it like an object, a row, a document, right? They can acquire a shared lock. And if someone else acquired the same shared lock, you can acquire unlimited number of shared locks. Readers are called reader locks. And then if someone want to update, there must be no shared locks. To, to update that. Why? And the reason is because if I'm reading something, I want to make sure not, it doesn't change. Goal of shared locks, right? So that's that's the locks we know. And exclusive locks, of course, will give you exclusive access. The moment you obtain an exclusive lock on that object or row, nobody can change it. Why? Because nobody can acquire a, a shared lock. And that's basically the two simplest type of locks, which are also aggressive if you think about it. Right, because if in real databases, like when you read something, you absolutely other transaction can't change that thing, right? So 
real databases don't really acquire access or shared locks and exclusive when you do normal operations. They don't do that, right? They do other type of lighter weight locks. And that's what we're gonna talk about here. Can you still acquire access, uh, shared locks and uh, exclusive lock? Yeah, manually, explicitly say, hey, I want, I want an access shared lock on this. I wanna simulate this experience. And you can absolutely do that. With that out of the way, let's start with this document. All right, so we're talking about explicit locking here, four types, or actually more than then. Uh, table locks, things that happen at the table level, and again, it's not really locking the whole table. Don't, don't think of it like this way. Like, oh, I'm locking the whole table. Nobody can do anything. There are lighter weight things that happen at the table level that tilt Postgres things here. Yeah. Row level locks, things happen at the row level. Page level, because databases work with pages, you can lock a certain page. And again, we don't have many information about that particular one. Deadlocks. Things that happen when two transactions try to manage the same resource and they are waiting on each other, you end up with a deadlock. Advisory lock, that's a, also called application locks, level locks, which is uh, apps can create this concept of a mutex that is manually created by the app, but those live in the database. So other apps that try to acquire the same advisory lock will will wait. And you can do cert so much cool things with those. You can serialize as a different logical operation, even if it's not really a transaction, right? You, let's say your application is is performing a, an operation, but this operation is, is also multiple transactions, right? So you need to protect the whole operation, not just that transaction level, because you have protection at the transaction level. So you can operate at that level. So let's say you want to prevent people from running this operation twice, concurrently. You can't just do that with normal transactions because your application, your operation might acquire multiple transactions and, and, and at a whole, it's one unit of work, right? So advisory lock. All right, let's, let's get it started. Postgres SQL, provides various lock mood to concurrent control access to the data to data and tables. These modes can be used by uh, for application controlled locking in situations where MVCC does not give the desired behavior, as I told you, right? Because MVCC, which is multi-version concurrency control, doesn't always give you what you want. You need, sometimes you need more and that control is given to you as well. Also, most Postgres commands automatically acquire locks of appropriate modes to ensure that reference tables are not dropped or modified in incompatible ways while the command executes. And that's an interesting thing, right? So we, so they're, they're giving an example here. For example, truncate cannot safely be executed concurrently with other operations. So it obtains an access exclusive lock on the table to enforce that. Access exclusive, as we're gonna see, here is the highest level of locks. It's the most aggressive one. It's you do that when you actually want to change the layout of the whole thing, right? It's acquired by truncate because let's see how how do you do a truncate operation? You might say, oh, delete all the table. No, 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 that's just so not performant because you know that's a truncate that is undoable. What do you do is you literally create another table and point the pointer of this table, your name pointed to the empty table. Leave the whole thing, that old table just goes away. That's how I would do it, you know? It's, it's, a, it's an instant. That's how you truncate your table. And to do that, you wanna make sure that nobody actually reading that at all, right? And how do you know that? Through other type of locks that we're gonna talk about. All right, so let's get started with table level locks. The list below shows the available lock modes and contexts in which they are used automatically by Postgres. Again, it's an automatic operation. It's not really implicit. So this chapter called explicit locking is a little bit confusing. You can also acquire any of these locks explicitly with the lock command. Interesting. I didn't know that. So you can acquire any of these, just say lock and simulate an access share simulate an access access exclusive like a truncate like as if you run a truncate 
Huh, that's very interesting. Probably not a good idea unless you know what you're doing, right? Remember that all these locks mode are table level locks, even if the name contained the word draw, which which is what confuses me here. You might say something called row share. It doesn't really mean it's it it's a row lock. It's actually a table lock that has happened to be called row share. The names of the lock modes are historical. The to some extent, the names reflect the type, the typical usage of each lock mode, but the semantics are all the same. The only real difference between one lock mode and another is the set of lock modes which, with which each conflicts. That's what important, what matters. When we see a lock mode conflicts with another, and that's where the blocking will happen when it comes to transaction. Two transaction cannot hold locks of conflicting modes on the same table at the same time so if transaction a is holding a certain lock right type and the transaction b want to hold a conflicting type right it will it will conflict and they will block each other however a transaction never conflicts with itself right for example it might acquire ex a transaction might acquire an exclusive lock and later acquire access share lock on the same table. That's fine. As long as it's the same transaction, that's fine. Like it's similar to how you write and you can read your own rights, right? And you can write your own rights. You can change the things you just changed. That's fine. But it's other transactions can do to you, that to you. So that's a very interesting thing. And I want to start, and instead of try starting with these uh, lock mode. I want to start with the most aggressive one. Access exclusive. This one conflicts with locks of all modes. And you can manually acquire that using something called the lock command. Or it can be implicitly acquired by these operations. This mode guarantees that the holder is the only transaction accessing the table in any way that's the most aggressive one right you can't read you can't change you can't do anything when this lock is acquired by another transaction example drop table if you're in the process of dropping table nobody can read it nobody can write to it if you're in the process of truncating which you must mean that you acquired an access exclusive Nobody can do this, anything to this table, can read it, can do anything. Right? That includes another transaction trying to truncate that same table, right? Access exclusive kind of conflict with access exclusive, right? Re-index. If you want to re-index that whole table, I want to make sure that I'm reading this and I don't want anything to change it, right? Because in re-indexing the table or even create index for that matter should create uh, that should acquire the same log because i don't want anyone changing the state of the table uh, inserting new stuff while i'm re-indexing because i can't miss stuff right because uh, as i'm reading 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 someone just changed something if someone just changed something then i'm not i'm not gonna pick it up and my index is gonna be out of uh, state uh, out of out of sync cluster if i want to cluster my table such that on a certain column i want to reorder the heap and the table on that column i can call this command and the moment you're starting shoveling things up in the table changing tuple location that will require you to essentially re reset the tuple ids create new tuple ids and as a result not only you have to update all the indexes, but also you have to change. You have to make sure nobody is screwing with that table in that process. Vacuum full. Vacuum is an operation that mar removes dead tuples that are not visible by anyone. Right? It's dead. Uh, nobody's needing that record anymore because even if it's like an older running transaction that still needs that, for example, it's a repeatable read that requires cons uh, MV MVCC and needs that row. No, all these row transactions are committed. This row has been dead. S someone updated, someone deleted it, and that, that, that that's done. With the, we have zero reason to keep that row. If that's the case, vacuum will just remove it, freeing up space in that page for other tuples to go in that page. That's the only thing that vacuum does. 
vacuum full is here's an example before we go to vacuum full for normal vacuum if you have a page with all of it filled with dead tuples let's say not just page 10 pages let's say you deleted a massive number of rows in your table if you just do a normal vacuum eventually it will mark all these pages as uh the rows are deleted so those pages are still there occupying space on the table but they are free to be inserted in you can insert stuff in those pages right that does not mean it will be reclaimed and sent back to desk no you're still acquiring whatever how many pages times 8k which is the default page size right vacuum full actually does that vacuum full removes physically remove all these space you know compact the table rename things if if necessary like if you if you, if you have like pages zero to ten and all are dead the whole pages are re renamed i think right it's like okay from zero to ten it's like unused now and pages 11 and forward are used no the whole thing will be just cleaned out right we start it over from page zero and start moving data around and so so it's, it's shuffling the whole structure so it has to acquire access exclusive right to do all this thing. refresh materialized view a materialized view is a view that is materialized that is persisted on disk right and to make sure so because it's persisted and instead of actually on demand you query the database and give you the view materials view is faster but they can go out of sync right so to refresh the materials of view we want to make sure that while i'm refreshing while i'm copying data i make sure that nobody actually touches that original table so i don't want anybody to touch anything right so i'm gonna acquire that and remove it of course concurrently can be added to indexing to certain things that to allow other operations to concurrently do things like you can create index concurrently create index can can lock the table of course right with access exclusive i don't see it here but I, i'm pretty sure it does if, if re-index is there why is create index not there it doesn't make sense right i would imagine like create index will also block so create index concurrently doesn't need to and we're gonna go with that now we understood the most aggressive let's just start the least aggressive which is access share right so access exclusive and access share these are conflicting locks access share is acquired by selects normal select not like select for update just normal select if you like do a select on a table right or if you select a row from that table the whole table is uh locked with this type of uh, lock which is access share for that transaction so access share lock now we obtain it that means the moment anyone selects that select something right and it leaves that transaction open you cannot truncate the table you cannot delete the table you cannot drop it you cannot do anything like re-index or vacuum full this version will be blocked if someone is actually reading so that's very critical so vacuum full is really not something you have to do but normal vacuum shouldn't really block that and that's what i want to understand truly as i as i dig deep into this let's continue so access share simple operations right role share a role share is the select commands acquire a lock of this mode on all tables for on which one of the for update for no key update for share or for key share options specified in addition to access share locks on any other tables that are referenced without any explicit for options so because we're reading like we're doing a select statement so we're acquiring a shared law a shared access access share but then we're also acquiring a row share on the table so someone in this table did a row share and <laughs> I know the names are very confusing right which means someone did an actual select for updates so technically they didn't really changed 
they didn't really edit anything, but they're acquiring it for update or for for share or for uh, for for key share. These operations will acquire an explicit lock at the row level, which we're gonna talk about, right? But also acquire a, a table level lock called row share. So it gives indication. This gives an indication to Postgres that something is happening on this table, right? Row exclusive. So what what happened here? Row exclusive. Row exclusive would, happens when you do the normal DML stuff. Like if you insert a row, if you delete a row, if you update a row, the table is marked as row exclusive for that transaction. Again, we're, here we're still at the table level. So what happened with that? Those kind of conflict with other operations. They kind of conflict with share and share or exclusive and exclusive and access exclusive. We're going to come to that like in a minute. And we're gonna, when we see the table. So if you do a merge and insert and update, this is acquired at the table level. And, and it will tell you what can and can't be done. And of course, access exclusive, the moment you do that or select, you can't re-index the table, you can't vacuum, right? Because that conflicts with anything. But I'm interested in the, in the, in the, in the small things here. And that's what I'm really interested in. Okay. Share update exclusive. Oh, we're getting interested now. Share update exclusive, right? Conflict with share update exclusive. Share, share row exclusive, exclusive. It's, get, it's getting ridiculous right now, right? This mode protects the table against concurrent schema changes and vacuum runs. Here is interesting. This one, share update exclusive, is acquired with vacuum normal vacuum not full because we know vacuum full re changes the whole structure right and acquires an access exclusive normal vacuum right acquires simple share update exclusive which is eh, lightweight slightly lightweight what can you do with this guy right when you do that you acquire this share update exclusive and we'll see what can't we do with this, right? Does it, it, it conflicts with share update exclusive, which is itself. So no two vacuums can run this at the same time, right? It conflicts with share. We don't know what share is yet. We're going to come to that. It conflicts with share row exclusive. Share row exclusive. Which we didn't explain yet. It, it talks with exclusive, which we didn't talk about yet, and then exclusive lock, right? This mode's protect table against schema changes. Like, if you're making a concurrent schema changes and vacuum runs, this will protect the table against it. So, what things are acquires this? If you do an analyze, if you want to actually get the table statistics, update that table statistic, you acquire that. So, technically speaking, so I can absolutely do... Uh, a vacuum and continue to insert rows in the table because those guys do not conflict with each other. We'll look at the table in a minute and, and understand this. Uh, create index concurrently acquires that, right? So you can still create rows. That's what really matters to me, right? I can create update and delete while create index concurrently. I can do that, right? I can do create in statistics. I can, I can re-index concurrently and do all of that. What is share now? share conflicts with row exclusive share update exclusive right row exclusive is the is the one ah now this is actually interesting right share that's our shared lock thing so when you acquire a shared lock on that table you can't really change that table right because it conflicts with row exclusive and row exclusive is the one that acquire when you update insert and delete so that's a dangerous one so if you if your transaction acquires share like a create index i create index can't be run in a transaction i think not right or maybe it is yeah yeah it's this is postgres it's not um it's not oracle so yeah create index will acquire share lock on the table and when you do that you can't do any updates or insert or, or deletes to your table and also, it conflicts with share row exclusive, which we talked about. No, we didn't talk about share row exclusive here. And it acquire and it conflicts also with share update exclusive, which is acquired by vacuum. So, if you're creating an index, you can't run 
a vacuum. Share raw exclusive. Come flex with pretty much everything, right? This mode protects a table against concurrent data changes and is self-exclusive so that only one session can hold it at a time. It's acquired by create trigger and other forms of alter table. So I don't see it much often, but it's gonna create trigger. How often you call create trigger? So I'm not really interested in this much. Exclusive. What is exclusive? This is acquired by refresh material view concurrently. So some of these are really interested to me. Some of them are really interesting. It's like vacuum is interesting to me. And I want to know like now with this knowledge, what conflicts with what? And this is where we're looking at this beautiful table here. And let's see if I can zoom in a little bit here. I, th I think that's fine. So we have access share on the left side side. We request row share, row exclusive. And of course, we have to go back to understand what the heck are these, right? Access exclusive again. This is the, 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 the hammer, right? And what is interesting is access share, which is the read select. And we have access row share, which is select for update. And we have share update exclusive, right? Share update exclusive is the, is the vacuum. Yes. Share update exclusive is the most important thing. So I can technically run a vacuum, right? While doing editing, right? And that's what really this box is the most important one to me. The reason I'm asking that is because you want to be able to run vacuum so you can freeze transactions as you continue such that you can run as often as possible. Nobody will should technically block you when you run vacuum. And that's the most important thing here, right? The only time vacuum will be blocked, which is this guy, is if you do a share update exclusive, what the heck is that? It's the same thing. Of course, it doesn't make sense, right? Like you, you're, it's like, uh, what else? If you, if you re-index concurrently, for example, right? It's like, okay, uh, my table, my index is corrupt. I just want to re-index it. Just throw everything away and just like re-index everything, right? For some reason, you want to do that. That will uh, that will prevent you from running vacuums, which is dangerous. You want to run vacuums as as often as possible, so to get rid of to freeze transactions, so you don't reach the 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 transaction wraparound, right? And that's really a disaster if you do. And also share. What's share? Share was like created by index. Like yeah how often you create an index, right? I'm talking about just like the operation that just is so aggressive, right? Share row exclusive. What the heck is that? Share row exclusive. Let's go back and read that. Yeah, that's the create trigger one. Who cares? And exclusive and access exclusive. So that's what, that's the most important row to me, really. And as long as I can read, I can write, and row share, what the heck is row share again? Row share is by select for update. So I can also do select by update for update, sorry, and still run vacuums normally, right? I suppose the the selected rows can't be touched in that case, right? Let's continue. Row level locks. Now we're moving up in the stack here to row level locks. All right. So now we talked about table locks. It's time to talk about row level locks, which is very interesting. Yeah. There are four types of row level locks. These can be obtained explicitly. You, know, you can actually say select for update, select for no key update, select for share, select for key share. And we're going to explain, talk about them and, and read through the doc here, understand what, what the difference between them. Understand that it depends on the lock here some locks can block other riders and other locals but doesn't necessarily block other readers and here's the, the, the most important thing here to to understand so these locks can be acquired as i said explicitly or also implicitly by updates and deletes deletes are easy right? but updates are the interesting cases here because updates there are two types of locks that can be updated by update and give you that because like an update can happen to the row on a column that doesn't have an index or it can up happen to a column that has an index and or can be referenced by primary keys and or i mean uh, foreign keys so that makes a difference 
on these updates. So soft updates, if you will, and hard updates that can cause ramifications. So let's talk about four update, which is the first one. You do you can do select for update, right? And this select for updates causes the rows retrieved by select statement to be locked as though for update, as though for update, as if you're actually updating it. This prevents them from being locked, modified, or deleted by other transaction until the current transaction ends. So this is like the hardest, the most aggressive raw locks there, right? There is other transaction that attempts to update, delete, select for update, select for new, you know, key share, select for key share, anything you do. If you have a row that is have been for updated, you're done. You can't do anything to all this stuff. You can read it though, right? It doesn't block normal reading of that row. Will be blocked until the current transaction. Conversely, select for update will wait for a current concurrent transaction that has run any of those commands on the same row. So same thing, right? If you want to run a select for update and someone had done a delete on that row, you can't do it, right? Because a deleted row is a deleted on another transaction, but might, might not have been committed yet. But now on your transaction, you want to read that deleted row. You can't do it. If you do select by update, can't. It will be blocked, right? And of course, in repeatable read and serializable, because they're using optimistic concurrency control, this thing will be will effectively be blocked, right? And it will, you'll get, get an error that says, hey, serialization failed, something changed from the moment you did this operation things has changed and i cannot i can no longer guarantee that 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 same operation will be read you know in a snapshot anymore i can't do that and you're gonna get an error here's an important important part select for update lock mode is also acquired by delete if you do a normal delete on a row that is as if someone did a select for update on that row very critical to understand so at that row level lock and also by an update that modifies the values of certain columns, not all columns, right? Concurrently, the set of columns considered for update are those that have unique index that can be used in a foreign key. So that is the reference here. So with that said, how do I differentiate between updates that update the key and updates that doesn't update the key? There you go. The name is clear here for no key update. Hey, I'm doing an update, but I'm not updating any keys, no index keys or anything like that. So this, this is identical to for update. I'm doing a for no key update in this case. I'm doing for update, but I'm not really updating any keys, except that the lock is acquired. Is this is not, so? This is very similar to for update, but it's weaker. Right? This lock will not block for select for key share, for example, because I know that the thing I'm doing is not really updating keys, right? So it's safe to share a key, if you will, right? This particular lock is acquired when you do a normal update. If you update a column, right, implicitly, like doing an update, that particular lock will be acquired for no key update. Like as if you if you're updating like column B and B doesn't have an index, that lock will be acquired on that row, and that's a very soft lock. So you can technically we'll, we'll see what conflicts with others uh, here in, in a minute. For share, so behaves similarly to for no key update except that as a, this acquires a shared lock rather than the exclusive lock on the retrieved row. Right? A shared lock blocks other transaction from per performing update, delete, select for update, select for no key update. Right? You can even do that, but it does not prevent select for share and select for key share. Because that, that's, that's the definition of shared lock. So now if you actually do want to do a shared lock, you do select for share and that row. And you, you can have a hundred transaction doing select for share. That's fine. It doesn't conflict with each other. But only once you do that, no one can actually update the row if you do that physically it, it, updating the row becomes impossible because you you just acquired a shared log here so this one the for key share is will block you from making deletes right 
but it will not block it will make, block you from making deletes will block you from making updates to columns that are indexed that has keys but it will not block you from making updates to columns that doesn't have keys so it will not conflict with this for no key update so let's go look at the at the table here so yeah i'm telling you this this is like a really head spinner so let's go through the concurrent locking for row locks here all right let's take a look at the table here and see what conflicts with what so row locks for update is the kind of most aggressive one where it kind of conflicts with everything you know uh, it is acquired by deletes if you actually delete a row it is acquired right if you if you update a, a row that has a primary or even a secondary key any key really right that's from what we read here uh, it does not acquire when you do a normal update on a column that doesn't have an index which is very critical to understand here right you can do those kind of updates but they won't require that particular key uh, lock right and it will conflict with all this stuff right so the second one is uh, for key select for for no key update right so it's an update but it's not updating keys so uh, this is acquired when you actually explicitly say that select for no key update right or when you do an update on a column that doesn't have an index this this is what what gets uh, uh locks and by doing that that kind of lock you will still still conflict with normal for update so like you cannot update a column that has been deleted right or you cannot uh update a column that has been updated with a key right that's critical to understand right and but you can definitely update a column right that has been for has been read for key share right so that for key update right it doesn't it doesn't acquire for key share so what does what what for key shares doesn't seem like something will acquire that because from what we read nothing from postgres acquires that except the user so if you do an actual select for key share, you can technically update things that are not keys, right? That's what you can do, right? And then we could go with another harder share lock, which is for share, which basically will block any update to that. You can still acquire many shared lock on that guy, but you will, you, you want to you want to prevent deletes and any kind of updates right right but if you want to acquire this for key share you can do a delete updates but you you may want to allow uh updates to none keys and in this case you can you you can up acquire that i can't think of an example to be honest to do that but the most important thing to understand is just really just the delete example and the update example the update example is the interesting one because it has two cases, right? Uh, can I read? In all of these cases, you can absolutely read the row, even if you delete it or update it, right? That's that's fine, right? But if you want to simulate, now the question is like, how do I simulate a, a, an access lock or a shared lock versus exclusive lock? You can do that. So you do a select for update, and if you really want no one to read that your application must submit selects for share all the time so that they get blocked right because they will do that and now now you can play tricks with your application and you say all right i want to do a select for key share such that hey i'm, I'm really really relaxed I, I i'll let you do delete i'll let you do updates but uh, update to keys but if you're updating things that has nothing to do with indexes uh, I'll let you do that. You can you can go a little bit lower there. Then let's run through the page locks here. Page level locks. Um, in addition to tables and row locks, page level 
Shared exclusive locks are used to control read-write access to table pages in the shared buffer pool. So the shared buffer pool is where the Postgres put their pages in. So it's a shared memory between all the processes that Postgres spins off. And then you can, it, it, it basically puts shared and exclusive locks to this. And absolutely there is no control here. Right? These locks are released immediately after a row is fetched or updated application developers normally need not to be concerned with this but they are mentioned for completeness here so this makes me think like what happened if i am updating or inserting or reading are we actually locking the page so this tells me that you know to transaction these two things are serialized right the page locks are being obtained to prevent two threads, two processes from updating the same page. And understandably so, right? It doesn't make sense to have, like, uh, this is now we're at the OS level in memory, right? This is like basically a mutex. So, yeah, yeah, so it makes sense to have page locks. I'm just worried about yeah, performance when it comes to concurrency of multiple processes updating the same pages. Like I've seen this in SQL Server and I have no idea about Postgres level of page locking there. And uh, like assume I'm doing many inserts, right? To some table or multiple transactions, right? Multiple clients, let's say, because each client gets a process in Postgres, like a backend process. So they, those two, might essentially perform the insert themselves and try to update the same page, right? And when you do that, these will contend on the last page effectively because all of them will basically insert at the same tail page, right? That's where inserts go. And I'm, I'm, I'm just thinking, what is the ramification of doing that on concurrently? I think you, you will feel it. Because at the end of the day, a mutex must must be acquired, like a lock must be acquired at the page level. Otherwise, you get corruption. Deadlocks are interesting. Here, I have the whole video about deadlocks, and they're talking about an example here where deadlocks can happen. So especially especially if you're doing explicit locking, like when you're controlling the transaction, like all of a sudden you can easily get into a deadlock where this is needing this transaction needs this, but this transaction is also needing something, and they are waiting on each other. For example, let's read an example here. If transaction one acquires an exclusive lock on table A and then tries to acquire an exclusive lock on table B, while transaction two has already a exclusive lock on B and now wants an exclusive tab on A, then neither of them can proceed. Right? Note that deadlock can also occur as a result of row level locks and thus they can occur even if the explicit locking is not used. Ooh, okay. How? Right? I've seen it in SQL Server a lot, but especially with certain custom applications, right? Consider the case in which two concurrent transactions modify a table the first execution, the first transaction execute update accounts, set balance equal balance plus 100, where account number equal 100, right? Equal 1111. So that's, that doesn't update to the balance. And I don't know if, if balance is actually, what is balance? Balance is, I don't know if it's indexed or not, but let's assume it's not. So it's a for no key, right? lock this acquires a row level lock on the row with the specified account number so that particular account number is now locked and the second transaction executes this update set account two All right so someone just increased their account by 100 the other wanted to debit the account at the same time right so it it executed two queries in the same transaction one to increase account 2222 by 100, which is okay, that are all locked. But then that other transaction also d decrements the account 1111 by 100. So that has to wait. So that so far, there's no deadlock here, right? The first update statement successfully acquires a row level lock on the specific row, so it succeeds updating. However, the second update statement 
finds that the row is attempted to update is already being locked. So it waits for the transaction that acquires the lock to complete. Transaction two is now waiting on transaction one to complete before it continues the execution. So far, no deadlock. Then the first transaction up start deducting account number two right two 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 with a hundred now it don't wants to do that and now it's it detects that there is a lock on that row and get stuck so absolutely especially in these kinds of situations you can get into a deadlock right transaction two already hold the lock so it waits for the transaction two to complete thus transaction one is blocked on transaction two and transaction two is blocked on transaction one added lock condition postgres will detect this and abort the transaction immediately postgres will immediately detect this right it's called the deadlock graph so very careful especially when when you up when two transactions try to update the same rows in certain order so how do you solve this be consistent the problem this happened because we first updated row one and then the second transaction updated row two first. Like if you flip this order, then it would have second transaction wouldn't have even permitted, started to begin with, right? But you can't always control this. That's the problem, right? In the application. Advisory lock is probably its own topic, to be honest. But advisory lock, uh Postgres advisory lock are those locks that are uh, acquired by the application so let's take a look here postgres provides a mean for creating locks that have application defined meaning as i said right these are called advisory lock because the system does not enforce their use right it is up to the application to use them correctly so hey you have this application you create them you you deal with them right as a database if if someone tries to acquire this lock i'll block it if it's already exists and advisory locks can be useful for locking strategies that are awkward for mvcc and, and i've personally run into this a lot uh, in cases and i've personally locked uh, run into cases where i i had to use advisory lock right in, in sql server they're called application level locks and oracle calls them something else but yeah sometimes you have specific the application has certain semantics that spans beyond uh, transactions, really. And you can't really rely on that, right? So for consistency, you use application level lock. All right, guys, so that was a, a very long podcast discussing all the types of locking in uh, Postgres. Uh, I learned a lot about this, and I, I think I'll use this knowledge for, you know, to understand when someone says oh our vacuums has been blocked and we can't run it i want to call that out i was like what does that mean why would vacuum be blocked because now that i understand the vacuum as an operation what exactly does it block is it's it's truly important right because it tells you like what kind of workload people are running right because vacuum is not being blocked by anything there are specific operation that is blocked by it and understanding this level of details uh, it makes me at least uh, want to learn more all right guys thank you so much goodbye